This is Carlton. Now a change to the advertised programme. We join Jonathan Dimbleby for War on the West. An unbelievable horror. An unspeakable atrocity. Untold thousands of victims. Why? Who? And what now? Good evening. Tonight, with the full scale of this catastrophe yet to unfold, there is no room for doubt. What happened yesterday was, in effect, an act of war on America, as the President said, on the West, indeed, on all of us. This was Manhattan at dawn this morning, on the dawn of a new kind of world, a new kind of threat, a world in which we are all prey to what Tony Blair has described as a new kind of evil. We've now seen those images of this evil again and again. They're numbing and incomprehensible, but they also describe a new reality. Who would do this and why? And what can be done to stop it happening again? Over the next hour, as we try to make sense of these questions, we hope to be hearing from some of the most influential and thoughtful voices from across the world. Starting with Philip Blader, who's here, the former ambassador to the United Kingdom, senior advisor to the Morgan Stanley Bank, which had its offices in the twin towers of the World Trade Center, and someone who's worked at the most senior level in the White House. Um, Mr. Ambassador, before I ask you to respond in broader professional terms, you are closely linked to those people who were working in that tower. You must be filled with the most extreme anxiety for their fate. That has been the, the primary concern of all of us in the firm. But as I hope you understand, it's, it's not appropriate for me to comment further about that at this time. Like everyone else, you are waiting and presumably praying. Also with us here, Jamie Rubin, who served in the State Department, Lord Owen, the former British Foreign Secretary. Um, it is still, James Rubin, virtually impossible to comprehend this. Do you have a sense of what this has done to your country? Well, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in and around New York City. I, most of my adult life was spent there or near there. Uh, my family are all New Yorkers. I'm obviously an American. America has been attacked. But I also feel that I'm a citizen of the civilized world, and I, I really believe that as the world comes to really appreciate what's happened here. This attack on the World Trade Center is an attack on civilization itself. And it'll never be the same for me or any visitor to New York to fly to New York and not see the World Trade Center uh, in the skyline. And I think it's a reminder that the world has changed. It's changed utterly. Uh, what the result of that will be, what the response of that will be, is obviously something we can talk about, but it never will be the same. Uh, Mr. Lader, I said before that you worked in the White House and you've been through dramas before. Nothing, of course, of, of this order. Can you give us a sense of what the mood will be there, how people will be dealing with one another, what will be going on under the President's chairmanship? Well, at first, of course, everyone in the country, and the White House included, has a sense of profound shock of the utter disregard for the sanctity of human life. But the processes which continue and we trust in orderly fashion, first the provision on a mammoth interagency basis of services, governmental services to the victims and to their families. Simultaneous with that is the, is the, the process of healing, of the president's leadership, resolve, steadfastness, and leadership. But in addition to that, the intense investigative military preparations to determine with certainty who is to blame. And as you see now, the president beginning to marshal international support for whatever action would be taken. And only then, notwithstanding all the processes leading up to that simultaneously, is the determination of what is the response that is purposeful, measured, and proportionate. 
Let me now bring in Senator McCain, who is, I think, in Washington. Senator McCain, good evening. For our viewers here, of course, just a reminder that you ran for the Republican nomination in the last election against President Bush, but now obviously standing full square behind him. I, I was saying to James Rubin, who's here in the studio just now, that this is still virtually impossible to comprehend. Um, what do you think it has done to your country, to your people, now with what? 24, 30 hours since the first devastating news? Well, I think the shock uh, and surprise uh, in, uh, at the beginning is now beginning to turn into a very cold fury uh, at what has been done to innocent American civilian citizens. And I think that fury is, uh, is intense. And I think that the American people uh, fully expect us to respond and respond in such a way that this threat will never be presented to the United States of America again. Well, let me push that with you a bit. The President's made it clear that it's not only terrorists who are in America's sights, but those who harbor terrorists, uh, which must mean states. Do you expect yes. a response of a military kind if states are identified against those states as well as against the terrorists those states are harboring? Yes, I do, including uh, retaliation against states who may assist uh, these terrorist organizations. The, we all know there's a network among certain, in certain countries, most of them in the Middle East, uh, uh, where there is free access, money, training, uh, and uh, sanctuary for terrorist organizations. And uh, with, without that kind of support and without that kind of home base or sanctuary, these organizations uh, may, may have existed, but they certainly couldn't exist with the effectiveness that they are existing today. Well, I don't want to misinterpret what you're saying, but if I understand it correctly, you could be talking about a retaliation, a war, if you like, because the President has said it is war, yes. against not yes. only terrorist groups, but more than one state, if you conclude, the, your administration concludes that more than one state has been harboring one or another of these groups. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, I, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And, uh, and I believe that uh, the American people would fully support such actions. And I, I also feel that unless um, this lesson is learned by these nations, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Libya, North Korea, uh, that we will continue to be faced uh, with, this, with this challenge of terrorist attacks in other forms. How long, given the pressure and the American feeling, in political terms, in your judgment, how long has the president got before he has to be, has to be seen to take some part of that action that you're describing? I think that the president uh, can act in a measured way because I don't think this is going to be one attack. I think it's going to be a series of operations uh, that will continue until such time as we feel confident that these organizations, not just, not just Mr. bin Laden's organization, if indeed, and I emphasize if, his organization was responsible, but other organizations that have committed acts of terror against American lives, property, and servicemen. So I think, uh, I think the president has time because I think that he wants to make sure as much as is possible who is responsible and who needs to be responded to. And uh, so I think he has a, a, a certain period of time here that Americans will, will exercise patience. Don't leave us for, for, for a moment, Senator. James Rubin, mm -hmm. um, on this, the two parties in America have often divided, have sounded so far at one. Is a response as is being uh, uh, suggested by the senator against groups and against countries, you heard him very clearly spell that out, an appropriate response for the American government to take given the possible implications of that sort of action? Well, clearly Senator McCain is accurately representing what I expect uh, not being in Washington to be the bipartisan view of all members of Congress in, in feeling that uh, this must never happen again. I would separate the issues a little bit more perhaps than Senator McCain did. There is the near-term question of what group was responsible for this act that was uh, so horrible that we saw yesterday and what states, if any, uh, were supporting or harboring the group that did this. 
And I think there's no question that a response to that action is going to take place, and take place sooner rather than later. But more importantly, and I think this is what Senator McCain is getting at, if it is, I think it will be easily bipartisan, is that this is a wake-up call for not just the United States, but for the world, that the states that sponsor terrorism for other actions different than the one that took place yesterday are going to be part of our enemy in a long-term campaign. But, but, but you're not just talking about, in the case of those states, diplomatic isolation, sanctions, or whatever it might be. Senator's talking about military action against those states. You're saying, yes, if the state is identified as a harboring state, that is the right action. There are cases on the books uh, that have not been determined precisely who's responsible and whether their states have been uh, supporting them. The Cobar Towers bombing is an example of that. And what I'm suggesting is that this action yesterday, this attack, this act of war on the United States, is not only going to result in a response for those who committed this act, but will also be a wake-up call for all of us, and not just okay. in the United States, but around the world, to develop a coalition of civilized countries against those who would commit it. Let me pick that up in relation to Europe and the United Kingdom with you, Lord Owen. Um, uh, we've heard from Europeans, all European leaders and others, absolute rhetorical support for America. Do you believe that that is rhetorical support for whatever action of the kind that both Jamie Rubin and Senator McCain have been talking about might involve military action of the kind they suggested or referred to? I certainly think that Britain will support it. I suspect France will. Whether the whole of Europe will stay with a sustained campaign against international terrorism is open to question. Because there's been that. a lot of flakiness in the yes. past. I mean, this is not a new problem. What is really different now is I think the United States will take on these international terrorist training camps, which we all know have existed and frankly have existed for far too long, irrespective of who has actually, if we find who's responsible for this particular thing, there will be a resolve that this has got to stop. It ought to stop before. Reagan was right to attack Libya, criticized very by many people at the time, and Britain was right to support him when he did do that. The Israelis, some time ago, took out an Iraqi nuclear installation. Much condemnation. They were completely correct to do it. The lesson of the last few decades is that we've all of us relaxed too much. We've made excuses to justify not taking on terrorism. We've got to do it now, and we've got to recognize that this will take time, and we've got to sustain support from, it's not just America's problem, it's our problem every bit as much as theirs. But you're describing a new world, I put the word in inverted commas, order, close inverted commas, in which there are a permanent set of, one hopes, small scale, very fierce actions by the United States, by NATO, by the, by, by the West. In well, some well, under the you're UN Charter, about. you're entitled to self-defense. You're entitled to take action to stop future terrorism. Uh, let's leave aside the word retaliation, which is you're not open to under the Charter, but you're entitled to take this action. And the nature of human life is nobody wants to go uh, breaching the territorial integrity, the airspace of independent countries. We've held back from doing it for understandable reasons. From now on, we won't hold back. And I believe that's the threshold we've crossed. Uh, uh, Senator McCain, very briefly, um, uh, you've just heard there what Lord Owen, former Foreign Secretary, said. Are you uh, encouraged that Europe will be the kind of uh, ally that you would like to see? Oh, I'm, I'm sure they will be. Uh, I believe that it is uh, the United States' job and, uh, and the President's job to uh, reinforce this coalition, to consult, to cooperate, and work together, just as his father did uh, during the time of the Persian Gulf War. And I believe that Colin Powell and the President are, are hard at work at that. Uh, the Atlantic Charter, as you know, uh, Section 5, an attack on one is an attack on all, and clearly we have been attacked in an act of war. But it's going to take work. It's going to take a lot of consultation and a lot of effort, but I believe we can hold this coalition together, and I think we can include some of our Asian friends as well, because uh, as uh, Mr. Rubin mentioned, uh, this, this attack on the United States Senator? could easily have taken place in another country. Many thanks. 
to you for joining us. And now to pursue this through a little further, perhaps the most mind-boggling question of all, perhaps, is what kind of people, what sort of organisation would and could mount such a well-orchestrated and such a devastating attack. It seems incredible that just a handful of terrorists, armed only apparently with knives, could thwart American intelligence, breach American security, and execute, execute this horrendous act against the most powerful nation in the world, which likes to regard itself as Fortress America. And of course, there's intense speculation about who did it. Inevitably, perhaps chief among the suspects is Osama bin Laden, who is accused of being the mastermind behind a host of other terrorist atrocities. But there are other names, other groups, and even some nations, as we've just been hearing, that are also in the frame. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, and freedom will be defended. But how? And against who? Who did it and why? Who are the suspects? Out of the rubble and confusion today, there have been a few leads. We know that the FBI have today arrested two people in Boston, and they're searching for another suspect in Florida. They've also taken a car away from the car park at Boston Airport, and it's reported to contain Arab literature, containing aircraft information and flight timetables. There's also a clue from one of the doomed aircraft that took off from Boston Airport. On the passenger list, as I understand it, are five Arab names, including a Palestinian with a Canadian passport. Now, this in itself may not be very important, except that Canada is the North American center of operations for the world's number one Islamic terrorist, Osama bin Laden. He is the son of a wealthy Saudi Arabian builder. For years, he's based himself in Afghanistan, and there he's recruited hundreds, some say thousands, of young Muslims from many countries, among them Palestinians. They have been trained in conventional warfare, explosives, suicide bombing, and he is known to have pilots among their ranks. <laughs> We incite Islam to rise up and liberate its land, he preaches. We must conduct a holy war for the sake of God. To us, every American is an enemy. His organization is essentially an umbrella organization. Uh, he does have his own people within that organization and dropping down to several levels. Uh, but also it's believed that uh, bin Laden and his organization work in close cons uh, consort uh, with uh, other uh, militant organizations out there. Um, we just need to look at uh, the, uh, what is happening in Israel uh, at this moment uh, to identify a number of those uh, potential groups that could be working with bin Laden. And they have found a new weapon, haven't they? The world thinks in terms of chemical weapons, nuclear weapons and so on. This is the ultimate terror weapon. But the civil airliner has always been the Islamic terrorists, especially the Palestinian terrorists, favorite weapon. They introduced the word skyjacking to us. In September 1970, they skyjacked three airliners, landed them in Dawson's Field in Jordan, and blew them up. It heralded the beginning of the Palestinians' war for independence, and they called it their Black September. And September has since become the most symbolic month in the terrorists' calendar. Today is indeed the anniversary in 1970 of the, hi the triple hijacking and the blowing up of the jets at Dawson's Field, right. uh, which I think you even covered yeah. at that time. I witnessed it, yeah. Indeed. Um, and that, of course, led to the clampdown on the Palestinians in Jordan by King Hussein, which in turn led to the creation of the Black September movement. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the, in the eyes of rejectionists, uh, Palestinian and Arabs, the infamous Oslo peace accords being signed. And if you go on into next week, the 16th is in 1982, the anniversary of the uh, massacres in the refugee camps of Sabra, Sh of and, Sabra Shatila. and Shatila. And then, of course, at the end of the month, the 29th, 28th, last year was the beginning of the Second Intifada. So it is black September as a month, and one would have imagined that the intelligence services would have remembered that. Every American is our enemy, he's declared, and everything American has become his target. 
In 1993, he was blamed for the first bombing of the World Trade Center, killing six people and injuring hundreds of others. In 1996, a suicide bomber drove a truck packed with explosives into the American army base in Saudi Arabia. Nineteen soldiers died in the blast. In 1998, he was blamed for the suicide bombing of the American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. And a year ago, another suicide bomber attacked the American warship USS Cole and killed 17 sailors. Bin Laden has never publicly claimed responsibility for any of these attacks, but few doubt that he has been the prime motivator. If we look back through the history of civil aviation, the uh, Palestinians, uh, yes, they've uh, hijacked a number of aircraft, they've blown several aircraft up, uh, but never on such a scale, never this audacious. Uh, it takes somebody like bin Laden, uh, I think, to come up with, with an audacious plan such as this. When the pictures of yesterday's attack in America were shown in the Middle East, there was some celebration on the streets of Iraq, Libya, and the Israeli-occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza. But then these people have well-known grievances against America. And they will tell you that when yesterday's American casualties come to be counted, they will not match their own at America's hands. I believe that uh, there needs to be a re-education of people in the West about Islam and about Muslims for a long time. Is this the way you're going to teach us? Bombing, bombing the World Trade Center? There's a huge amount of propaganda against Islam no, and Muslims. Just forget propaganda. I saw it, you saw it. Is, it. is that how you're going to teach us to love Muslims? We should ask ourselves the question, why are people bombing the Pentagon? Why are you and bombing the World Trade Center? I'm not bombing the World Trade Your Center. Your people are, and you defend them. We are saying that there is a legitimate struggle for Muslims to liberate their land and to defend their life and to defend their honor. What is needed now, says Imran Khan in neighboring Pakistan, is a peaceful way out to understand the reasons why. They should not spare anyone who's responsible for this because there's no justification. But there should be some sort of a thought process should start. Why are people so desperate to kill themselves? What has driven them to that state? You know, there's a need to think about that too. There should be a debate on that. Clearly, nothing justifies what has happened. And tonight, there are reports that bin Laden has fled to safety in Pakistan, something that's denied there. I don't think he's ever been to Pakistan. Well, that's my understanding. Uh, whether he's moved in here secretly, no one can say. But, you know, the, ever since uh, the Pakistan pressure was put on the government, I don't think that uh, bin Laden would dare come to Pakistan, given the tightening of the noose all around him. If there are still doubts about who did it, President Bush has none. He and his security forces are now actively looking for Osama bin Laden. Now, maybe he has already left Afghanistan and crossed into Pakistan. Maybe he has already left there. If he has, then he's running out of friends. The few he had now fear American revenge. And they have good reason to. That was Michael Nicholson, of course, with that analysis. With the turmoil in the Middle East long now at boiling point, some analysts do wonder if the radical Islamic groups from within the Palestinian community, linked perhaps to uh, Bel Adin, might be responsible. A short while ago on a slightly dodgy satellite to the West Bank, I spoke to Hanan Ashwari, spokeswoman for the PLO and now also for the Arab League. Hanan Ashwari, we've heard Mr Arafat express his shock and his distress at what has happened. At the same time, we've seen hundreds, thousands of Palestinians apparently rejoicing. What are we to make of this? Well, I haven't seen hundreds or thousands. All I saw were some clips from yesterday, uh, right after the incident, where the full impact of the horror of the incident wasn't known, where people in ignorance thought it was something political and they came out in a very visceral and, and unthinking way. And these are a very small minority. Are you and saying I don't that think that this, this should be used in order to malign a whole nation and to say that all the Palestinians feel that way. This was only an initial reaction before knowing the whole import and impact of the, the horror that had happened. Are you saying that the great majority of the Palestinian people, despite their um, hatred of Israel and their hostility to the United States, share the feelings of distress that Mr. Arafat expressed? 
Absolutely. I know this for a fact. Uh, we've been talking, I've been talking to people on the street. We've been meeting in, in civil society institutions. I've talked to President Arafat and the leadership. There is a unanimous condemnation and a sense of identification. The Palestinians are victims themselves and they feel that the, the American people are innocent victims as well of, of a tremendous act of uh, terrorism that, that has horrendous dimensions and implications and therefore the, the initial response of a minority of a few ignorant people should not be used in a way to slander a nation. It has been manipulated, I know this. There is of course huge speculation about who might have committed this atrocity. People have seen Palestinian suicide bombers kill Israelis and inevitably they ask could it not be those extremists who are also willing to kill Americans? Well, the, this should not be extrapolated. What's happening is that small extremist groups uh, who are from uh, uh, religious political parties have carried out such uh, individual acts. Yes, we haven't condoned them, but uh, their work has been limited only to a situation of occupation, and they've targeted only Israelis. So I don't think that one could superimpose the situation of occupation here to the U.S. And of course this uh, horrible act in the United States is one of tremendous dimensions that requires serious uh, resources and training and skills and organizations and uh, organization. And it seems to me this is way beyond Palestinians but at the same time we don't have a quarrel with the American people. A lot of people are suggesting that it could be uh, Osama bin Laden who is responsible for this. Do you regard him and those who work with him as a friend of the Palestinian people or an individual and groups who are inflicting untold damage on your cause? Uh, actually, there is no relationship whatsoever beyond being threatened by their people. I know I've been, many of our people were, and I know that uh, uh, we've been accused of all sorts of things for advocating a peaceful solution. I don't think Osama bin Laden has anything to do with the Palestinians in any way, shape, or form. Can you, Hanan Ashwari, uh, offer any explanation of how individuals can act in this way with such cold hatred, committing a clearly, closely calculated atrocity? Well, I wish, I wish I knew. I wish I were a psychologist or a psychiatrist who would give uh, satisfactory explanations, but all I can do is conjecture that it may be people who are driven by uh, resentment, by anger, by hate, by uh, blind uh, ignorance, by overzealousness, by whatever, uh, or maybe an attempt to prove oneself or, or a single-minded approach to reality where they lose sight of good and evil, where they dehumanize and devalue human lives. This is something that is utterly atrocious, wholly evil and unconscionable and entirely unacceptable and therefore it must be dealt with as such regardless of the motives. There is a warped mentality there at work and it is as you said cold-blooded, calculating and, and uh, uh, premeditated and therefore it should, it should be dealt with as such within a global rule of law on the basis of the rule of law but without jumping to conclusions and without starting to assign blame without evidence. Hanan Ashwari, thank you very much for joining us. Enjoyed now by Ehud Barak, the former Israeli Prime Minister, and the Middle East specialist Rosemary Hollis. Um, Hollis, sorry. Uh, Mr. Barak, do you accept what you heard there, that the PLO does not only repudiate that atrocity totally, but also that there are no links of any significance at all with uh, bin Laden? I believe that the PLO and the Chairman Arafat could do much more in order to uh, reduce violence living up to his commitments according to uh, internationally signed uh, commitments to put an end to uh, violence. He deliberately turned to violence after uh, Camp David being somehow unable to uh, take the tough decisions that were needed in order to put an end to it. And if we look at objectively from the very events in the early 70s. Unfortunately, uh, we should uh, tell the truth that the Palestinian movement was the source of a lot of terror but and a lot of loss of life of innocent uh, uh, civilians all around the but world. But not this is a, it's, a, it's an important point at this juncture. Do you accept whatever your criticisms may be of Chairman Arafat and the PLO leadership in the West Bank and in Gaza, that they 
are distinct from those who commit this kind of atrocity? I, I don't know who committed this atrocity. Most probably Osama bin Laden of, or, or one of his groups. And they should be dealt with uh, on their own merits, so to speak. But I would uh, re-emphasize the fact that we are facing a war against our whole civilization. And uh, we, you, you won't be able to differentiate so accurately in the future. The target should be all the terror thugs of the world and all the rogue leaders who are ready to host them. And the nature of the struggle is the same that our ancestors had against piracy on the high seas. Namely, you don't ask for the certain pirate that attacked certain uh, vessel, but you carry it tenacity, whatever the price is there, until this phenomena of terror against innocent civilians are out of the recipe of the civilized world. R Rosemary Hollis, um, there is inevitably much speculation about who might have done this. Uh, on the basis of your understanding, do you presume that the terrorists must have come uh, either from the Middle East or more broadly from the Islamic world? I don't presume anything of the kind. I would say that in his rhetoric, uh, in the objectives that he has sought to promote, Osama bin Laden is volunteering to have the finger pointed at him. We simply don't know how the network of connections that he belongs to operate. And it will do us not much good to try and decide if there might be any Palestinians within that network of connections that exist. What I'm conscious of at the moment is, and I'm hearing this from a number of Arab contacts in a number of Arab countries, please don't tar us all with the same brush. Please don't assume that because some extremists are capable of absolute atrocities, that all Muslims and all Arabs have to be branded together. And if you select targets loosely and say, we can't be sure, which I'm not sure if you're suggesting just now, uh, that, that, that unfortunately, because we're at war, that is, that is too bad. Uh, these people are going to feel sacrificed. L l I, I want to return to this in a moment. I want to, to, to bring in Bob Hunter from Washington. Good evening, Mr. Mr. Hunter. You, of course, were formerly in the first, good evening, in the first Clinton administration, you were ambassador to NATO. I don't know how much of this uh, discussion you've heard, but the question I'd like to put to you is, um, we, we've, we've heard um, various Americans both here in the studio and from Washington, Senator McCain, say that there has to be a very significant response, not only against the terrorists, but also against the states that are thought to be harboring them. Rosemary Hollis, you just heard there, saying, you've got to be very careful here, otherwise you can make the situation much worse. If you get the wrong people, the wrong country, you could exacerbate it, and if you tire everyone with the same brush, there is a serious problem. How do you read it? I think the United States does have to respond forcefully to get whoever was involved in this and get them all, uh, chase them to the ends of the earth. But it's also true that you don't want to play into the hands of whoever did it. Let's assume it's Osama bin Laden or someone uh, by taking out uh, innocent civilians or going after uh, countries and leaderships that he just as soon see brought down. The lesson here, and I think the Bush administration has been very wise and very careful, comes from what George Bush, the father, did. In uh, 1991, he understood that he was fighting a different war from Saddam Hussein. Saddam wanted to portray himself as the little guy defending the Arab street against great big uh, Goliath America. He tried to portray it as uh, himself against a Zionist imperialist conspiracy. That's what he called it. Uh, Bush put together a coalition, 31 countries, including four Muslim states, to try to demonstrate that in reality, this was this thug, mm. Saddam Hussein against every civilized person, whether he was Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, or whatever. But if you that's can't, what we need to do. We need it, to it, separate it, it out. It, you say separate it out. If it proves, as is conceivable, given the uh, inability of American intelligence to have determined in advance of this atrocity who had done it, if it proves difficult to identify who actually was responsible, who was harboring, and what constitutes harboring, you either go in with the risk of making serious errors of the kind that you've just identified yourself, or you delay and delay while the heat builds for an action that can't responsibly be taken. Well, you have on this occasion every resource of the United States government, plus now we see at NATO, which is in the process for the first time ever 
of invoking Article 5, an incredible amount of resources to do it. But just to remind, right. just remind, of, think, just to remind uh, Article 5 is that an attack on one is an attack on all, and therefore all NATO's forces all. are deployed, potentially. Well, all, all NATO countries agree that they will join together to counter it. First time it's ever been done by NATO. Uh, now, the administration is being very careful it doesn't get dragged into indiscriminate attacks that just work uh, for the terrorists. Now, uh, he has time to play with, not a lot of time. I think part of what the president was saying last night is, if there's somebody out there that's involved, some government, cough these guys up now, or it's going to go much worse for you later. But if it turns out there's some government that's really been playing uh, uh, hand in glove for quite a bit of time, then the United States must take some action against that government, whatever it is, uh, because they've had enough warnings over enough time, and we're not going to be taken for patsies, and we can't be. American credibility in the whole effort, not just against uh, uh, terrorism, but also to try to build something Mr. positive in the Middle East and elsewhere, depends upon our showing we cannot be dealt with in this way. Mr. Hunter, thank you very much for joining us. Very briefly, just to come back, if I thank may, you. with you first, uh, Rosemary, Rosemary Hollis. Do you accept that America can't be taken, his phrase, as a patsy? Something, military action, has to be done or not? Or do you I think, think it would be calculated to cause greater problems? I think it's certainly within the American ethos that they have to be seen to exercise resolve. This is how they conduct their policy, and they can't change character overnight. Having said that, I believe that America's allies are asking them, please be aware that if we're going to be upholding international law yes, I, and I, the rule of law, indeed. then let us not be seen to break it. Uh, and Mr. Barak, if I may, with you too, sure. do you accept that however great the anger, um, however strong the need to react, caution is important if you are not to escalate a situation? It's clear that certain military operation will, de will be taken once the President of the United States will know who is responsible for this attack or who directly harbored this uh, kind of uh, group. But the whole issue goes beyond it. The real essence is not just military operations. The whole world can isolate and should isolate from any kind of contact every rogue leader who is ready to support terror. It doesn't matter if we are, as a free world, are unable to respond at this moment. And you will see the shock in a few days when the number of uh, people that lost their lives will become clear. And when it becomes clear what kind of symbolic uh, 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 shattering a blow it was for the Western civilization, no way but to isolate whatever rogue leader we know the names it's Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Libya, maybe some other partial players in the Middle East. I must ask you to pause there, Mr. Barak. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you in a moment. I'm absolutely sore, Mr. Rubin. Of course, there have been atrocities before, plane hijacks, suicide bombers and the rest. But this is of an entirely different order. The first time that a, a terrorist group has conducted an operation on such a scale and by taking civilian airliners and using them as weapons of war against, as we were just hearing, thousands of innocent men and women. The scale of the massacre is not only unprecedented, but it clearly required a terrifying degree of planning and coordination. Self-evidently, it has the gravest implications not only for America, but for all America's allies around the world. Manhattan, devastation on the scale of a biblical prophecy. As emergency teams search for survivors, Awkward questions are now being asked about American airline security, questions that have been ignored in the interest of cost and convenience. In domestic United States flights, they're buses to them. They're the same as getting on a train would be for an English person. And we don't go through um, security checks to get on board a um, network South Central train at Waterloo. But that's the way the Americans treat their domestic flights. More than 1.6 million people take to the skies here every day. September the 11th, 2001, was no different. Everything is aimed at processing as many people as possible, 
In the late 1990s, the airlines rejected government recommendations for tighter security on domestic flights. It's a very, very slick operation and security was going to get in the way. So the, uh, the government decided, and this was while Clinton was president, the government decided that Americans' domestic airlines would not have to have a high level of security and that is where we are today. A former American Airlines security agent told us standards are well below European counterparts. It is lax. It's very lax because they don't perceive a threat. From a security point of view, flying internally in the United States is a pleasurable thing because they get you through fast. They don't want to hold you up and uh, the security is non-existent. This was apparently the case yesterday morning. American Airlines Flight 11 left Boston at a quarter to eight, bound for Los Angeles. 25 minutes later, a United Airlines flight took off, also heading for LA. An American Airlines jet then left Washington, also heading for the West Coast. United Airlines Flight 93 set off from Newark for San Francisco. Within minutes, some of the passengers turned terrorists. To cow a plane of 80, 90 people, if you've only got a couple of knives between you, you have got to impress on people very quickly up front. They're going to die very nastily unless they do exactly what they are told. And one can only but guess what they did to achieve that level of shock. What happened next beggars belief. Oh, shit! On board each plane, small groups of men had taken control of the flight decks. The effects were utterly devastating. They seem to have asked people on all of the aircraft to phone relatives and friends, basically to say, I'm on a hijacked aircraft, I'm going to die. Again, the planning to use modern technology, air phones, mobile phones, use the technology of the enemy to spread your message. This is frighteningly efficient. 18 minutes later, another plane ploughed into the World Trade Center. The first aircraft hit the tower, the Twin Tower, and everybody for a long time thought that was probably an accident. No alarm bells, an accident. It wasn't until the second aircraft hit the uh, second tower that everybody realized that this could probably be something more sinister than an accident. If the pilot was still in charge at that point, he was trying to go past close enough to fool the hijackers into believing that he was aiming for the World Trade Center, but in fact aimed just to miss it. Then the hijackers just probably grabbed the wheel from him and turned it into the World Trade Center. 40 minutes later, another plane plowed into the Pentagon, and then a fourth aircraft crashed south of Pittsburgh. This set of attacks shows the highest planning, highest level of coordination, highest level of determination. It, to use an expression, an awful expression, was perfect. They have achieved practically everything they ever could have desired. But they were assisted by poor security. Two years ago, investigators from the Federal Aviation Authority posing as passengers were able to board aircraft illegally 117 times. Some even got on with knives. In my experience, in respect to what is classified, I suppose, as a low-risk knife, i.e. a Swiss Army knife, yes, it's uh, rather easy to get it on board. Um, from a security point of view, if American Airlines is not a problem. Now, security couldn't be tighter. No flights will take off from the United Kingdom for which we cannot apply the highest standards of security for air crew and passengers. The skies above London are silent this evening, the government having ordered that no flights should pass over the capital city. But soon our airspace and that of the United States will be busy once again. And if there's an early lesson that can be learned from the horror of yesterday's attacks, it is that cost and inconvenience should never again be allowed to affect the quality of airline security. Martin Bashir with that report. Uh, James Rubin, you've worked inside the State Department, you've worked inside uh, Washington. Um, no one apparently saw this coming. The intelligence agencies didn't see it. Pentagon attacked. 
thought conceivably that they were after the White House. Uh, it is an appalling vulnerability on the face of it. So my question to you is, is that we've been through intelligence, sharing intelligence, better intelligence. The talent's been there in America and in Europe for a long time. Is better intelligence to stop this kind of threat actually possible? I think you have to operate on two levels. Uh, when you're talking about using force, as we've been during the course of this program, it's not for retribution, as some seem to suggest. It's for preemption, because there are a group of people that are prepared to conduct these kinds of acts and train others to do them again and again and again. But isn't so the history of this, sorry, isn't the history of this is you, you shoot down one enemy, and because of the passions and the hatreds that are there, another one pops up. Well, I don't think that's at all clear. I think in the case of Libya, as was mentioned earlier, after Gaddafi received a, a blow from the United States, he's been getting out of the terrorism okay. business. But the, you want to root these people out who are training and organizing and supporting those who will do it. That's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation that you began to see in the, in the program you just uh, presented is what do you do to the liberties, the freedoms, the normal life that Americans and Europeans have come to accept. And this is where the, the very fine balance has to be walked. Clearly there was more that should have been done. Uh, most of the time that I heard the discussion of threats while I was in government at a policy level rather than an operational level, they tended to be of this cyber terrorism or biological weapons or chemical weapons or missiles. And we're talking about something much most, more basic. The most devilishly crude uh, operation which may have been no more than knowing how to fly a plane and getting an, enough crude weapons into a plane to force yourself into the pilot. But if, into these, the if, these, if these people could not be identified until one hopes afterwards, what do you do until you know where they all are, until you've taken them out, without effectively destroying people's normal liberty of movement, of travel, identity, ethnic minorities being suspects and the rest? It's a, it's a, it's a potentially, uh, almost in terms of liberties, self-destructive um, Well, uh, uh, this goal. is the debate that I think we're going to be having in the United States in the weeks to come. And I certainly hope that civil liberties are not the victim of an attack on uh, the United States, which has been the symbol of civil liberty since its inception. But clearly there are things you learn, unfortunately, from e each terrorist incident. And each time there was a hijacking, we learned a little okay. bit more about what we needed to do, and now we've learned something else. Mr. Barak, Israeli intelligent agents have been thought to be very good and have a record of also being very ruthless, of, as it were, retaliating first, if I can use that phrase. Do you believe America should... Uh, take a leaf from your book and, if necessary, assassinate those who you believe are behind terrorist acts in order to achieve that objective? I, I'm fully confident that if the American authorities will know next week that uh, next uh, Tuesday another attack of this nature is going to take place, they will do whatever they can, including self-defense steps in order to avoid it. And uh, let me uh, mention that uh, for what Jamie said about civil liberties. Unfortunately, we will have to pass a, a certain period of painful, somewhat constraints on civil liberties of the individual in order to protect the whole society and the whole civilization. I believe okay. that people will understand it. Do you, Lord Owen, believe that in Europe too we're going to have to face uh, deprivation of civil liberties in order to destroy or seek to destroy the threat? Yes. I don't think we uh, can underestimate the fact that this could happen in any other European country. It happens to be America, but we could be next. The uh, civil liberties are a very real question, but we do need to have intelligence. We do need to have secrecy. We do need to have some way of tapping phones from time to time, from interfering and getting under uh, faxes, internets. People object to all this, but we need it. We do need satellite surveillance. We do need a lot of these uh, techniques, and we need the resources. And I think we have devoted a good deal of resources to the IRA. We have foiled a great many bombs, but even so, we were not able to stop it. And that type of really serious uh, campaign that faced America would be very difficult to spot in any of our countries. So it has to be both a domestic uh, attack on this terrorism and also an international one. But the basic fact is that we have all of us shirked 
from taking on terrorism. We have talked to the terrorists. We have given the terrorists freedoms. Uh, we're all guilty uh, over the last 20, 25 years. And we've got to be much stronger, much tougher. Lord Owen, thank you. And now we can go to New York and tonight's reporter, Linda Dubley, who's just got there. Linda, I know you've driven through the night to get into New York, and this is your first um, sight of what it's like, but you know the city well. Just characterize how it feels to you there this afternoon, this evening. Well, I would say, Jonathan, that there's a mood of unrelenting courage, really, in New York City. It's exemplified by the Mayor, Rudolph Giuliani, who has really shown tremendous spirit and tremendous leadership in keeping the city calm. We know that that's one of the things that, um, that's being impressed upon people. You were talking earlier to Madeleine Albright's former press secretary, Jamie Rubin, about having to keep people calm and having to actually stop any, any incidents of um, racial hatred or anything like that breaking through. Through the night, police say there, one or, there were one or two incidences, but really they've been, re they've been uh, remarkably surprised at how dignified New Yorkers have been. National Public Radio was saying yesterday that, in a sense, everyone in America is a New Yorker now. There's such empathy and there is such sympathy with this city that has had its heart literally ripped out that actually, although we've seen a heinous crime, we have also seen today great dignity and, and great courage. Linda, we've also heard during the day these extraordinarily moving and very distressing accounts of individuals trying to make contact with their loved ones, perhaps making contact with their loved ones. Uh, extraordinary tales in the sort of human cauldron of disaster. Uh, have you been hearing all of this and have people been telling you about this? Well, there have been, Jonathan, great, great acts of heroism. One of the, one of the things that really touched us all so deeply this morning was when we heard that 300 firefighters are missing, presumed dead, 30 police officers and 40 port police officers also missing, presumed dead. Those police officers and those fire officers literally went back into the building in Tower Number 2 to try and rescue people and were then killed themselves. Many families in New York tonight are orphaned. One of the, the saddest sights, I think, for people must be that they've converted some schoolrooms into rescue centres. And the children here, many children, have either one or both parents working in the financial sector. And to try and give those children some sense of, uh, of, of hope they have put notice boards up in the school and they're desperately trying to attach names to, to some of those children to show them that Linda. their parents have at least been tracked down. But of course the sad fact of the matter is that many of those children will be orphaned in the days and the weeks to come. Linda, thank you very much for that. It is still almost impossible to believe that those twin towers to which Linda referred of the World Trade Center, the symbol and the reality of America's wealth and influence around the world should now be so much rubble and that in the ruins there lie perhaps many thousands of dead men and women, not only Americans, but very probably from other countries as well, not least from the United Kingdom, where it is feared that maybe some hundreds perished. The human impact of this, of course, is impossible to exaggerate, but there is another impact as well which can't be ignored. There are now fears that the slowdown in the American economy could, as a result of this horror, which demonstrates the potential of terrorism, could turn into a global recession, with all that that implies for the lives of hundreds of millions of people everywhere. City workers headed back to their desks in London today, still shaken by yesterday's events. One of our traders apparently was speaking to New York when it happened, and uh, he heard the blast from the uh, phone. It was devastating. We, we all like, went and watched the news feeds, and it was like our whole worldview shifted into darkness. It's been terrible. No one got any work done yesterday. A lot of Americans work here, obviously, so they've got colleagues out there, friends, family, so quiet and disbelief, really. Uh, we left yesterday at about 4 o'clock, and we were told not to come in today, and then got home, got a call, now you have to come in, so... Yeah. So you fear that this could perhaps become a target or...? Well, definitely. Second biggest financial centre. Yesterday's atrocity will almost certainly send shockwaves around the world's economies and could trigger a financial collapse worse even than Black Monday. I think this time the situation is more serious, actually. Given the knock-on consumer confidence, I'm not optimistic about world economic prospects. Under those circumstances, I think it's going to be worse this time than it was in 1987. 
there are some similarities, but there are also important differences, one of which is the fact that in 1987, the global economy and the UK economy were very robust. Now the global economy is significantly more fragile, and it wouldn't take much in terms of lower confidence in the stock market to drag us into a recession. Events of this nature are virtually unprecedented. Uh, and it has been an extremely long while since the New York Stock Exchange closed its doors to business. We have to go back to the Great Depression of the 1930s uh, to see equivalent uh, shutdowns. My personal feeling is that the authorities will probably do all they can to ensure that we don't have a panic. But panic or not, it's unlikely British investors or the economy will emerge unscathed. The honest uh, answer from most professionals, I think, is that uh, given these volatile conditions, it would be extremely dangerous uh, to set foot in the stock market until such a time as uh, this volatility has abated. The first thing is that we've already seen oil prices go up uh, on the back of this uh, terrorist outrage. If there really does come serious problems in the Middle East and the oil supplies are actually prevented, then you could see oil prices going up considerably more. Obviously, anybody who's driving a car will find that his fuel bills are rising. Um, the second thing is I think that it may well be that this will hasten some job losses, and that is clearly bad news for, for, for some people who will lose their jobs. And I think the third thing is that I do now see interest rates coming off more than I otherwise expected. And if you're a mortgage holder, that's good news. If you're a saver, it's actually very bad news. The economic fallout from this atrocity will spread rapidly. In the corporate world, it's easy to identify a, a few key casualties in terms of the types of industries. One is obviously the insurance sector, which is going to have to foot the bill of not only the destruction to the buildings in Lower Manhattan, but also the loss of life, which is going to be horrendous as well. Another notable casualty are going to be the airlines. Business travel and indeed tourism between Europe and the United States is going to fall back dramatically. The American economy was already hovering on the brink of recession before yesterday's tragedy. I suspect that uh, this yesterday's tragedy will actually tip it over into recession. Now, the American economy is so very, very important globally that I suspect it might trigger off recession in the rest of the world. And after all, we already do have global slowdown. There's no question about that. The German economy is effectively stagnant, which is a very big economy. Japan is already in recession. And of course, we have been slowing down. So I think when people do talk now about a global recession, I don't actually think they're being that absurd. I think there is a possibility that we will get a global recession. Our economic future hangs in the balance. When and where America strikes back and how hard could determine all our futures. If an oil producing country is bombed, the consequences could be dire. The world economy and world financial markets now face a period of immense uncertainty. We really are in completely uncharted territory here. What happens globally will partially depend on how US markets react once they open again, but also on the precise response from the US government to yesterday's terrorist attacks. A lot of it will now depend on what the President and the US Congress decide to do and, and, the, and the method of their response, if you like. But clearly, if there was some sort of um, uh, military um, escalation in the Middle East, that could lead to um, a further escalation of, uh, of uh, world oil prices. Caroline Kerr with that summary of the potential predicament for the global economy. I'm joined now by Ruth Lee, who you saw in that clip from the Institute of Directors. Uh, Ruth Lee, just expand the thought uh, a little. Fear and anxiety around the world, there is. Um, the American economy is mm. in slowdown. Why do you fear that it tips over? I think in the second quarter, the American economy was almost stagnant. There was virtually no growth at all. And the thing that was holding it up was consumer confidence. So still, the, the obviously, consumer expenditure is a very, very large part of the American economy. But uh, yesterday's event surely will hit consumer confidence quite hard. Directly, you're going to see people going out less, traveling less, especially by plane, spending less. That will clearly have a knock-on effect on consumer confidence. And if the markets do come off further, uh, as suggested by one of the people on that particular film, then, of course, that will have a, a, a wealth effect if shares do fall further in, in the States. And given the, the old cliché about America sneezes and the rest of the world catches a cold, how, given the state of the other major mm. economies in the world, how do you see that 
as being likely to unfold? I think it's, I think it's very bad news. The American economy, as it's been so obvious since the beginning of this year, is incredibly important to all the other economies around the globe. Uh, if you look at Euroland, uh, Germany now is essentially stagnant, France is slowing down, we're slowing down as well, but we'll be supported to some extent by increased public expenditure. And so I can see these, if there is a recession in the States, it will have more knock-on effects and here. And of course in the Far East, you do have Japan, which is essentially already in recession. And, and, in, and in real lives, that means jobs, jobs, Absol jobs. Job losses. And it was interesting that last week there were some bad numbers out of the States on jobs. And of course that did spook the Dow. Uh, Ambassador Leder, do you share that pessimism? We hear leaders quite naturally, our own Chancellor today, uh, Federal Reserve, saying things are okay, we can hold the line. But do you share Ruth Lee's sense that the, this terrorism could have the impact she describes? Well, there are certain elements of possibility. But I have to say that our financial institutions and the private sector are fully operational that there is a resolve in the business as well as political community that the culprits of these atrocities shall not be victorious. And so in that sense, I believe we will move forward. The two points that I must add, though, that I think are critically important and have not been raised yet in the program, we have one president and the American people today, and I trust in the weeks ahead, will be subordinating partisanship to the leadership of that president. And finally, though we're a nation of many faiths, we are a religious people. Perhaps the question as to how America survives this and moves forward depends as much on that character of the American people as anything else. Do, do you believe that the anxieties and angers of the, uh, that, that the American people have and are likely to go stronger in the days ahead can be uh, uh, transformed, if you like, into saying we are going to ensure that America continues economically strong. If we know that consumer confidence means we have to go out and do business, we will do that? Or will they find that very difficult to do because of the fears and the anxieties that Ruth Lee touched on? It will be difficult. People are stunned. But there is the resolve that things will continue, that America not only will survive, but will prevail. And so in the terms of the global economy, I think that leadership from the president and from the business and financial institutions continues to be very promising, notwithstanding how shocked we might all be tonight. Uh, James Rubin, we've discussed clearly in the program so far, it's self-evident, we are uh, on the edge of a very uncertain, threatening, rather frightening era. People could not have ever imagined that this would happen. The American dream, optimism, is part of how you identify yourselves. Given this, do you, I mean, it's quite difficult to see how one can be optimistic if you're going to have to have greater restraints in order to protect the American system. If we are likely to have conflict that we've already talked about in the earlier part of this program with all the tensions that that creates around the world, very difficult for even the most patriotic American uh, to feel optimistic. I don't think today is a day for optimism, Jonathan, but what it is a day for is resolve and determination. And I think when this is all done, uh, one of the sad tragedies will be that the United States perhaps needed this kind of a, a demonstration of the vulnerabilities that much of the rest of the world have lived with to perhaps be more and more part of the global community that needs to be created uh, the civilized community and so I expect the United States to resolve to move forward and not let the terrorists win and the mayors and the governors and the presidents are going to be making that point at the same time leading the world in a real war on terrorism so this can happen again here or anywhere else. But won't there be an equal temptation not least from this administration I take exactly what y you say uh, about the uh, behind one president to actually withdraw from the world rather than go back into the world no, on the contrary, I think when, when President Bush, with the support of members of Congress from the Democratic and Republican Party, leads a coalition of civilized countries to respond to this act of terrorism, uh, we're going to be, have an opportunity to change the world, to make it a better place. And one of the great things that happened, if you recall, during the Gulf War, when President Bush's father led a coalition, is the Middle East was changed forever and uh, things m were improved there for many, many years. And so this is going to change in ways that we can't even predict. But one thing I do predict is that America will stay engaged in the world and its determination uh, perhaps will be redoubled. 
James Rubin, thank you very much. Philip Leder, thank you, and to you also, Ruth Lee, for coming here. Thank you for joining us for this discussion. And that is all for now, but not the end of the story, of course. ITN will bring you any more developments that there may be through the night and tomorrow and after that. For now, on this bleak, sad evening for the people of America and for all the rest of us who are going to have to live with the consequences, good night. <laughs>